Good morning, everyone. It is lovely to see you this morning. Um, I'm firstly, I'm just going to ask for your prayers. Um, we, as a church, we've got a number of um, missions, partnerships around the world. One is with uh, the vineyard in Nigeria that Sunday heads up. Uh, we've had historic connection with the vineyards in East Africa and Kenya. Um, but we also have a partnership with the, uh, the vineyard churches in Bulgaria. Um, and so myself and Bethan are going out with Nasco and Tony to Bulgaria next Friday for the weekend. So if you could pray for us all, we'd appreciate that. Let me, uh, you might have seen this story on the news. It was a few weeks ago about a lady called Carly Bird. And it caught my eye because she loves growing vegetables. And if you know my wife, Bethan, she loves growing vegetables. So it caught my eye. Um, She has lupus and MS. She's on disability benefit. But she had, during the cost of living crisis, transformed her garden and other spaces into allotments to grow food for other people. And she had fed, at that point, 1,613 people. One night, someone got into her garden and sprinkled salt all over the ground, which is not good for plants. Her story got out on TikTok, And people donated £250,000 to her project. That's amazing, isn't it? Do you love a story of generosity? You're not it. I love it. I love stories like that. Why? Well, I believe it's because we are created to be generous. I believe that every one of us is created in the image of God, and he is incredibly generous generous, and we're to reflect that. Just look at the world around you. That speaks of incredible generosity. Think of the way that God gave his son for us. Immense generosity. I believe that every one of us is actually created to be radically generous. So a question is this, how can the generosity that is created in us be more fully released and expressed, especially if we're followers of Jesus? If you're here today and you say, well, I'm I'm not yet a follower of Jesus, I'm exploring, you are incredibly welcome, and I hope that what I share is helpful. But if you're here today and you are a follower of Jesus, I believe that Christians should be the most generous people on this planet. We are reflecting the nature of God. So we're in a series entitled Radical Generosity. It's also our gift day today. We're going to lead into that a little bit later. But if you have a Bible, could you turn to Luke chapter 21? This um, story takes place in the week before Easter. So Jesus has come into Jerusalem. He's now teaching in the temple in Jerusalem. And he, he t- he's told a story that predicts his own death. He's been asked about whether we should pay tax or not. He's been asked questions about marriage and life after death. And we know from Mark's account of this story that Jesus and his disciples were sat next to the offering table. And something catches his eye. Luke 21 verse 1. As Jesus looked up, he saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow put in two very small copper coins. Truly I tell you, he said... This poor widow has put in more than all the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. So you need to picture the scene. I'd love you to picture the scene. Jesus and the 12 disciples, they're sat near this offering table. Now, what that would have seems to have looked like is a number of wooden chests with a kind of trumpet-shaped receptacle, and people would make their offerings into that. And I imagine it, I can imagine rich people coming up and giving noisily, noisily. We know from other texts that some of those people would have been making their giving known. So I can imagine them coming up with a bag of coins, tipping it in, there'd be a whole lot of commotion, which is basically, hey, look at me, look at me. And then this widow comes along, so we know that she's a woman who has lost her husband, so she has little means of supporting herself. And she puts two very small copper coins into the offering. Those coins are called lepta. 
Two lepta is equal to one denarius, or one sixty-fourth of a denarius. A denarius is a daily wage. Done a little bit of maths. Her gift, those two copper coins, are about 1.5% of a daily wage. The point is, not a lot. Tiny amount. Let me share three things from this story with us. First is that Jesus sees what we give. He sees. He sees the rich people. He sees the widow. And I believe he sees us. He sees how we spend our time, our energy, and our money. You know, every second of our time, Jesus knows what we've done with it. How many of you know your bank balance to the the penny? Jesus does. He sees. He sees. He knows how much we spend and we save and we give. He sees. He cares what we give. Why would he care? Why would he care? Well, I think one of the reasons is this. Jesus taught in Matthew chapter 6 that we can't serve God and money. Jesus knows how powerful money is. He knows how easy it is for material and financial things to become idols in our lives. And giving is the best medicine for consumerism. And Jesus knows that. And giving actually reveals what's going on in our hearts. The Apostle Paul writes this in 2 Corinthians. He says, Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion. That that could be sort of what's going on in our hearts. But what he says is, For God loves a cheerful giver. I think the message translates it as hilarious. It's supposed to be a joyful, you know, when when we give, when the offering basket, we should be chuckling. This is an amazing thing. That's the attitude of our hearts. I believe that Jesus sees what we give because he loves us. He cares. He doesn't want money and material things to become idols in our lives. I would love to just take a moment at this point and pray for us. And so whatever you want to do, put a hand on your heart. Hand on your wallet if that reminds you. Lord Jesus, I want to ask that by the power of your Spirit, you would help us today. Jesus, you've said that we can't love you and love money at the same time. And Jesus, we want to be the kind of people that choose to love you first. And so I pray that where money and material and financial things have become idols in our lives in any way, Jesus, I pray for your freedom today. I speak Jesus over our lives. Free our heads, free our hands, free our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Jesus sees because he loves us. Secondly, Jesus recalculates what we give. Jesus recalculates. Let me illustrate it this way. The widow had two tiny coins. I've also got here 250 pounds in British banknotes, okay? If you are on the average UK wage and you were to tithe, this would be your monthly gift. So I've got 250 pounds and I've got two pennies. If you could have either of these from from me this morning, which would you choose? Anyone going for this one? In the story, Jesus says that that is worth more than that. Now, it's very tempting to say, Jesus, you're rubbish at maths. The problem is, Jesus invented maths. If you notice the way that God's kingdom is so often upside down, so often upside down. Why did Jesus consider these two coins to be worth more than all of the other offerings? It's because I believe that to God, proportion is important. Proportion is important. You see, if you were to put a million pounds into the offering basket today, firstly, that would be amazing. Secondly, thank you. 
And thirdly, can you gift aid it? <laughs> but let me say, that amount is not an indicator of generosity. Because if you earn one billion pounds a year, that gift of a million is 0.1%, which feels like a long way away from the biblical idea of tithing and generosity. But if you only have 2p, and you put 2p into the offering, proportion's important. It matters. You see, as you read the Bible, particularly the Old Testament, there's a lot of instruction around proportion that was to be given. A tithe is very specific. In the New Testament, tithing is barely mentioned. Rather, the writers talk about generosity. So Paul writes this in 1 Corinthians 16, verse 2, about giving. He says, on the first day of every week, in other words, be regular in your giving, either weekly or monthly, on the first day, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income. Do you see the idea of proportionality? Paul says that our giving should be regular and proportionate. Let me at this point share briefly what Bethan and I do, how we approach giving. And I do so simply to open up this area of our life to you, to be honest and accountable to you. Please, as I share this, don't think any better or worse of us. If, if you do that, then I failed. Um, and if by sharing I lose some of my treasure in heaven but you gain, then I do that willingly for you. What we do each year at this time of year, we sit down and we estimate our income for the coming year. We pray, we talk, and we ask the Lord what percentage we're going to give. When Bethan and I first came along to Riverside in 1992, we were students. We tried our best to give a little. When we got jobs in 1994, we started to give uh, more regularly. We set up a standing order, and that's the way we, we still give today. A few years later, we started tithing, literally giving a tenth part of our income. Over the past 18 years, so since 2005, we've kept on taking steps forward in generosity. A few years ago, about five or six years ago, we felt the Lord ask us to give 20% of our income each year. So that's what we do. And since then, we've kept taking steps forward to grow in generosity. Now, at this point, I am not saying that you need to do what we do. What I am saying is, please would you seek the Lord and ask him what he wants you to give. And the reason for I'm sharing that is simply to say we, myself and Bethan, are committed to living as generously as we can and leading from that point as well. Now, some of you, as I share that, may be surprised that we give at all. I want you to hear very clearly that all of the pastoral staff in this church give to the ministry of Riverside Vineyard. Just because we're employed by the church isn't the issue. Giving is a matter of trust. It's an issue of discipleship. And we as pastors are trying to be disciples, just like all of us. This is an issue of discipleship. So we give as well. Third thing, Jesus loves radical generosity. He just loves it. You see, of all of, we need to bear in mind that this is in Passover week. This is when Jerusalem was really busy. The population of Jerusalem grew massively in the week before Passover. The temple would have been heaving with people. And of all the things that Jesus saw that day, the story of this widow made the cut into Scripture. And I love that. I love that we're still talking about her story 2,000 years later. She's a widow She's vulnerable, and yet she chooses to trust God. At the heart of giving is this. If I give generously, will things be okay? Can I trust God? Can I trust Jesus in this? That is right at the heart of giving. As we choose to live with radical generosity, we're saying that we trust Jesus, that we're putting our lives in his hands. Okay, as we mentioned, today is our gift day. 
Um, I'm just going to remind us of where we're headed with that as a church. We believe that the Lord is inviting us to be radically generous this year to the next generation of children and youth. And over the last couple of weeks, we've shared two specific things that we want to give to as a church community. So let me share those again with us. The first is to Vineyard DTI. DTI is Dreaming the Impossible. Uh, DTI is the youth movement of Vineyard Churches in the UK and Ireland. So this is just a little bit of a highlights video that is showing in the background here. Uh, DTI has a leadership academy. I think we've got one or two of our young people on that academy this year. Um, It supports the youth ministry in local vineyard churches. And probably one of the highlights um, are the road trip which we hosted, but the summer festival uh, which is taking place in July, August up at the Stafford Showground. Um, That just gives you, you're welcome to hit play again if you want to, Joel. Um, Because it's great, isn't it? It's a lovely video especially if you like camping. 3,000 young people on site. We went up for the uh, last day of it last year. It is just extraordinary to be in a room with 3,000 people, young people worshiping Jesus, meeting the power and the presence of his Holy Spirit. I think a couple of hundred young people gave their life to Jesus for the first time at the festival last year. As you can imagine, running something like that is expensive, especially coming out of the back of a pandemic. So as a church community, what we want to do is give at least £25,000 this year to Vineyard DTI. So that's the first thing. The second thing are some specific projects here at Riverside Vineyard that would serve our children and young people. The Lord is stirring something locally and globally um, amongst our children and youth, Gen Z, millennials, that kind of age group. I shared a bunch of stories a couple of weeks ago. Um, Our kids and youth ministry is growing at Riverside Vineyard. We're about to multiply the age groups here at the Felton site. Uh, Dave and Beth um, shared with me that between January and Easter, we added 52 new children into our kids' ministry. Um, Miriam is on team. Miriam is wonderful. If you've not met Miriam yet, go and say hello to Miriam. Uh, She's a wonderful addition to our team here um, in children's ministry. We've got children and young people leading worship, uh, developing leadership skills. I believe that these are exciting times for us. At the same time, one of the things that we are seeing is an increase in neurodiversity. And as a church, we want to be inclusive and accessible to children and youth that need additional support. And so one of the things that we are wanting to do is create specific spaces for children and youth with additional needs. So here at the Felton site, we've identified two rooms, one on the ground floor for youth and one on the first floor uh, for children that we want to kit out and resource for children and youth with additional needs. The reality is, in a room of like 30 or 40 young people, youth with additional needs just some time to check out, to have a breather and some space. It is the same with our children's ministry. They are designed to be high energy and buzz. That's how we design it. There are some children that just need to kind of like... They need a little bit of space and a breather. And so we've been training team. There's some exciting things going on in that space as well. But this is, if you click to the next slide, or you might have done it already, that, that's an artist's impression. And you click to the next one, Joel. The, these are some of the spaces that Trent Vineyard have set up, and we would like to nick their best ideas. <laughs> so these are the kind of spaces that we want to set up. At our stain site, we're going to make resources available to better serve children and youth there with additional needs. There's some other upgrades to Young Vineyard rooms and the outdoor play area. Um, The estimated cost of these projects is another £25,000. So we are praying, we're praying with faith that as a church community, both here in Feltham and at our Stain site, we would give at least £50,000 this year so that we can serve our children and young people. It seems to me that there is a generation of children and youth that need the hope and identity that only Jesus brings. Our culture is increasingly confused and confusing. 
You might have seen something that went viral on social media over the last couple of days. It's a, it's a gender tick box from a hospital, an NHS hospital, and it now has 18 options. One of which is other. So the other 17 didn't work. Now, there is a massive conversation around issues of gender, and I'm not going there today, but I simply want to make the point that our culture is increasingly confused and confusing. And that is the culture in which our children and young people are growing up. I read a, a survey from the organization Mind, well-known organization. They reported this in 2021. 96% of teenagers reported that their mental health had impacted their schoolwork at some point in the previous year, 96%. There is an anxiety epidemic. There is a mental health epidemic right now. And I believe that as a church community, this is our time to step up and to step in. As I said a couple of weeks ago, I think one of the things we need to shout loudly is not on our watch. Not on, we're not going to sit on our hands and hope for the best. We're not going to sit on our hands and watch a, a generation kind of crash and burn. We're going to step up and we're going to step in. This is a moment to rise up with radical generosity for the sake of a generation of children and young people. Amen? Amen. Many of you hopefully have got the letter that we've written. We've made that available over the last couple of weeks. If you haven't yet got our letter and Riverside Vineyard is your church, then what we're going to do, we're going to pass them around now. So if I could have some beautiful volunteers, that would be amazing. And these are beautiful volunteers. So if this is your church... Then, and you haven't got one of the letters and response cards, please uh, take one. If you need an envelope or a pen, uh, just send them down the roads, my rose. That would be great. Please do take a letter, um, an envelope, and a pen. If you're online today with us, simply go to riversidevineyard.com forward slash gift day or, or click on the QR code. That will straight, take you straight there. If you're visiting with us today, so Riverside Vineyard is not your home church, that is, you're, you're so welcome, um, but could you just please bear with us for the next little bit as I just talk this through with us. Many of you here have hopefully spent a, you know, some time over the last couple of weeks just praying, inquiring of the Lord, you, you've hopefully already completed a response card, thank you so much for doing that. For those that haven't had a chance, you've got about three minutes to pray. I'm going to talk us through um, the response card very briefly. Um, they will also come up on the slides as well. You'll see on the top section on the left-hand side just a panel to fill in your name and address. If you could click on, Joel. There we go, top Top panel, left-hand side, your name and address. Um, that's really important that we know um, who is making various commitments. If you're a UK taxpayer, please do tick the gift aid box. If you're not sure whether you've made a declaration to Riverside Vineyard before, please just do it again. It doesn't matter that we've got two. Ju just, if you can't remember, just, just do that section again. On the top right-hand corner... We're inviting you just to commit to what you're going to regularly give for the co coming year. So just fill in that box with your regular commitment and do that between yourself and the Lord. Just to say, this is what I'm going to give week by week or month by month for the coming year, just as a commitment to the Lord. And then it would help us if you could just tick one of the option boxes. So if you've already got a standing order in place, but you're changing the amount, just tick that box. You will need to contact your bank directly. We can't make that change for you. If you'd like to set up a standing order, tick the next box down and then fill in the standing order section of the form. We will then send that to your bank. If bank transfer works best for you, tick the third box down um, and then you can use the account details on the form. 
If offering baskets are the best way for you, then tick the fourth box, just a way of indicating how you're planning to give. The section at the bottom of the form is for gifts to those children and youth projects, including Vineyard DTI. These are gifts over and above our regular giving. So again, on the left-hand side, you may want to give today. You can indicate the amount and then just enclose that with your response card in a moment. You may be pledging a one-off gift for later in the year. You can indicate that. You might want to set up a standing order towards these projects. If that's the case, fill in the section to the right on the bottom half of the form, um, and again, we can process that with your bank. Could you just note that the regular gifts go into a different account for these gifts to the children and youth projects, simply so that we can make sure that the gifts go to the right projects. What we're going to do is we're going to have a song break in just a moment, just to give us, um, any of us that haven't had a, an opportunity to fill out a response card, to have the time to do that. If you have any questions, there are trustees around. This is a panel of our wonderful trustees, um, including our new trustees. So Josh and Sandra have joined our team over the last few months. So you know who they are. So we're going to be around. Come and ask us any questions that are helpful to you. Then what's going to happen, our children and youth are going to come back in. They've been making their gift responses this morning, their commitments this morning. They're going to come and bring them. Um, and then we're going to worship and we're going to give together. Bottom line, and I'm going to close with this. Why would we be generous for the sake of the next generation of children and youth? What, why would we do this? Well, I love what Jesus said. I think, I think this is in Luke's gospel. Jesus called the children to him and said, Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. In other words, don't get in their way. And actually, I'll flip it on the head. Do everything you can to help them. Why? Because the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. We have an incredible opportunity, friends, to do an amazing thing, to help our children and young people find Jesus find his kingdom and live extraordinary lives for Jesus. And I'm inviting us to come into this space with all of our heads and our hearts for the sake of those children and young people. Can I pray for us? And then we'll have our song break. Jesus, thank you that you love us all. But Jesus, thank you that children and young people have a special place in your heart for those that maybe don't have much of a voice, for those whose lives are so impressionable, so delicate, so vulnerable. And Lord Jesus, as a church community today, we say that we're going to step up and step in. We're going to do everything that we can for this next generation of children and young people. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help us to respond in this moment. Lord, we want to respond with generosity in whatever way, uh, that, in whatever way you lead us to. Jesus, we want to be radically generous for our children and young people. And so, Holy Spirit, speak to us. Give us this grace in this moment. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.